Funny to announcers on Dave Sims and Book Shambi with us, with you, and with us, the great Susan Waldman from the Yankee Radio Broadcast Team. She works with John Sterling, been with John since 05. Susan, great to see you. Thanks for joining us. How are you? Oh, I'm okay. Today's a good day. Today's a good day. Sometimes it's not. As I was telling you before we went on, I got up, I washed my hair. I even actually got stuff so I could color the gray. <laughs> Gone. I got dressed. I have underwear on and everything. I'm all dressed up and no place to go. <laughs> this is a good day. Hey, it's great to, great to see you. Boogie and I have been having fun talking to folks. We just had Rick Riz on. Boog, you want you, you want to start your, your, with the questions for for well, Ms. Waldman thing, here? <laughs> I, I, want, I want to ask, how long have you guys known each other? Oh my God! Oh, so Dave and I. Um, oh, 87, 87, 8, 87, 88. Yeah. 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 Wow. Because when it was a soul man and coal man, coal yeah, man, was, soul man. Yeah, Eddie Coleman and I at FAN from what was that eighty nine? And Susan, of course, was the first. Uh, voice heard on WFAN, I want to say July of 1987. July 1st, yeah, July 1st, 1987. But didn't I meet you at some either Jets camp that fall? Or Probably, Jets yeah, good camp. call. I think and was and I was at WNBC at that time. Yes, yeah. you know what it was? It was the strike year. And we would go out there and, you know, we'd be standing there like morons. And it would come like Gastineau in his Lamborghini. And they're, they're striking. And, yeah, gosh. Yeah, that's where I think I met you. Yeah, that, that sounds right. And, you know, the thing that your story is so interesting in, the, in that you started as a, you know, as a performer, as a, a singer, and you're in Broadway. And then now, when I travel around the country and I see young women who are broadcasting and sportscasting, I'm like, do you know Susan Wallman? I said, yeah, it's one of my best friends. What are you talking about? Susan Wallman. You're a legend. You are a legend in, in broadcasting, yeah. in, in particularly baseball broadcasting. I mean... Well, yeah, that's a heck of a handle to be carrying. Good for you, and it's well, well earned. I, but you know what? I don't because I still get the same insecurity, and I still get the the same hate mail. And it to me, it's five minutes ago since an all star first baseman spit in my face. It's you know, it's five minutes ago from um, and you know, and, and maybe that's also what keeps me going and keeps having to prove myself because I'm never satisfied with anything. I think the great thing though, guys, is that now there are. I can name five young women who are doing play-by-play -play in the minor leagues, and um, and, and then it's fabulous because I did, I didn't think I'd, I'd actually get to see that, um, but they're out there, and they were you know they're in their twenties, so they will you know weren't even born when I started doing this, so um, it's that's gratifying. But legend, no. <laughs> when you think of your unique path, were there any times that you thought about, yeah, I don't know if I want to do this? Um, yeah, but you know what, Boog, I, I really didn't have a, a choice. You mean in, mean in, in baseball, in, yeah. in broadcasting? I didn't know what else I could do. And I think that what you do is you think, you know, and you know yourself, if you can look in the mirror and say to yourself, ask the question, do I have something different to give? Am I different from everybody else that's out there? I really think I'm different from anybody else. So as long as you can say that, you keep going. And I mean, I didn't, you know, I didn't have anybody take care of me. What was I going to do? And it was, and I don't like, as you know, I don't like somebody saying no to me. No, you can't do that. Because my thing is, what do you mean I can't do it? Why? Why? Because I'm female? What? Because I have a Boston accent? What are you kidding me? And it's, um, you know, that's, that's, that's part of it. A lot of nights I was, you know, Dave knows this. I sat in the press box at Yankee Stadium for a solid year. Nobody talked to me, not a writer. The other radio guys didn't. I was all by myself. A lot of nights that I'd go back to the high, absolutely. But you get up and you, you know, as Dave said, I'm a performer. And this is like maybe one of the greatest parts I've ever had in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. So you, know, you don't get to be down. You don't get to show people that, you know, you're crying because no one took you to lunch. I mean, exactly. that's there. So. Exactly. Hey, you know, I the, one of the stories I've heard you tell, uh, you've been a baseball fan all your life, and you got to meet, growing up in Boston, you got to meet Ted Williams, and you formed a relationship with him, you know, it, when you were you were a young kid. Yeah, when I was, uh, my grandfather had seats right in back of the Red Sox on deck circle, and, and in those days, you literally could reach out and touch the players from where I sat. And there were, don't forget, this wasn't Boston now. Um, I, this, there was no one in the park. 
I knew everybody in the park. <laughs> and it was, you know, and, and, and so many women and I would go down and I would like put my little face into the dugout where I was, I was probably four, three, four. And I first met Johnny Pesky, and that's how far back this goes. And because uh, Teddy was in Korea when I first started going to the games. And, you know, and I was cutie when I was three or four. And there was nobody there, and I'd wave, and they'd wave back. And I knew, I called Johnny Pesky Uncle Johnny till the day he died. And you knew everybody. You knew everybody, and that's how I knew Ted Williams. And then I re-met him as an adult when I was still a singer, because I used to sing the national anthem at Fenway when I was still in theater. And, um, you know, I got some, I, you know, the first interview I ever did for WFAN. All right, get me somebody. Okay, <laughs> I, I will. Um, Teddy, can you do an interview with me? Yeah, sure. And <laughs> we're sitting in Winter Haven, 1987. And we're sitting in Winter Haven in a minor league uh, ballpark. And we're, it's, it's all fenced in, and it's the two of us. And he talks to me on the tape recorder for a solid hour about everything, everything, the war and George Bush and John Glenn. And the thing that I remember the most is that when we finished, I looked up, and there were hundreds of people ringing the outside as we were sitting in there. One of the great things, I was singing at a, a benefit for um, Tony Canigliaro way back, and Teddy wanted his daughter, Claudia, she was 12 at the time. And Teddy said, well, Claudia wants to take voice lessons. What do you think we should do? And you know, you're a singer. And I said, she's 12, no, let her sing as much as she wants. And then I told him a story about how my mother took me down to the New England Conservatory and the head of the voice department said, bring her back when she's 16 because a woman's muscle is not developed then. And Teddy said to me, sort of like a kid with a curveball, right? And I said, exactly <laughs> like that. And it's just, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, you guys would remember, remember when um, the, the, la the all-star thing, when all the people were at Fenway and Teddy yes. came out in the, in the cart? All right, that, that um, cart was driven by a wonderful man, he's gone now, named Al Forrester. I first met Al Forrester when I was a tiny little girl. He had graduated from college and he was an usher in our section. So that's another one. And the great thing about growing up there is that, you know, until they leave this earth, they all stay there. So I'd walk into Fenway Park and I knew, Hi, how's, how's your mom? How's your dad? You know, your brother. They, everybody knew everybody. And that was um, kind of cool. So. Wow. All right. So we, I'm, uh, uh, this is terrible that I'm going to ask you this. What? But I know you love me. So which park feels more like home? Fenway or Yankee Stadium? Um, it, it depends. The new Yankee Stadium has never really felt like home to me. Right. The old one did. I knew every inch of that place. Um, the problem with Fenway is that it's so different now. It's yeah. not the park that I was. But I got to tell you, and this is kind of, you know, it was kind of hokey. When I walk into that park, I, to me, every time I'm in that park um, before a game, I'm walking up that that walk with my grandfather holding his hand and I and I know and you know which gate the 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 um, it was right next to the where the Red Sox clubhouse is if you walk towards home plate absolutely that's the first thing and and every time I walk by that I'm three years old and I'm holding my grandfather's hand into the sunshine into this you know little green jewelry box of a it, it that doesn't go away that does, never goes away it's absolutely. a funny it's a funny thing I uh, doing a game last year with David Ross who's a <laughs> manager now yep. he was on the team that won in 2013 and we came through the you know basically by home plate and we went up that ramp that's basically the entrance closest to the plate but it's still first base <laughs> angle so that when you come out the first thing you see is the monster and we both he's played on the field I've done nine bazillion games there and every time you come out there and it opens up and you see the green monster it just kind of oh yep. and every it was, time back then it was different because there was no upper deck it was just that one little thing and obviously no monster seats and none of that it's a great thing Ricky Henderson who really was my first friend on the Yankees 87 I remember we we're in Fenway and he said why do you do this why you know why do you put yourself through this and you know what do you what about baseball how much do you love it and I said come with me and I said this is where I used to sit and he's, I, he gets in and he sits and I said, now look around and pretend you're four years old. 
And he said, I, I get it. And it was, it's that kind of place. And I say all the time, everything I am in baseball is because I absolutely grew up in that park. Yeah. I mean, I knew Hayward Sullivan. I knew Mr. Yockey. I thought Mrs. Yockey was the most sophisticated woman I'd ever met. <laughs> she used to sit in white slacks and, and silk blouses and drink um, gin and tonics and a score. She had a cigarette and a score card. I thought she was the most sophisticated thing I'd ever met. I was a tiny little girl. And it was... Um, you just don't forget that. I mean, I don't have that affection for the, you know, the team. I mean, if Teddy comes <laughs> back and plays, that's one thing. Maybe if Carlton Fisk comes back, I'll, I'll go back. But it's, yeah, it's something. I, I get goosebumps now thinking about it. When you mentioned Ted Williams, you're talking about one of the, obviously one of the, you know, five, ten greatest players ever. You've also been around Yogi Berra. And I and also, uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on some of the great personages you've met uh, during your time with the Yankees. And you've had so many great moments with the World Series and everything too. You know, I, I, I'm glad you brought up Yogi in, and we were talking about Ted Williams because they were really good friends. And when I got George and um, Yogi back together at the museum, I had, I was hoping it was gonna work because I had all these guests lined up. And one of them was Ted Williams. And I had Garagiola, Bill White, Ted Williams, um, and all these people. And I remember after the thing, Teddy gets on and I'm giving uh, this flowery thing because you know, I'm introducing Ted Williams. So, <laughs> and Teddy says, Susan, for God's sakes, I'm not dead. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> and, it was, and Yogi and Teddy went at it for a while. And then George wanted to get in the act. So he's talking, oh yeah, George, how you been? Says Teddy, he's like John Wayne. And it was, you know, those kinds of things. Um, you know, you don't, you don't forget that. You don't forget the kinds of people that, that you know, um, you know, that, you know, also I called Lou Gorman, Uncle Lou. I mean, Hayward Sullivan, they were like my family. And of course, George and all the people that were around and the fact that I miss, I miss George every single day. And the fact that George is such an important person in my life, you know, I can't even believe he's been gone all that time, but it's, you know, to get to know someone as well as I got to know him, it's extraordinary. That's something that stays with you. He took a heck of a chance putting you in a booth, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I did. <laughs> do you know what he used to do? He told me that he would go to like bars, like Runyon's in the old days. Yeah, yeah, sure. He'd come in and he'd put on a hat and a raincoat to you know, hide, he'd sit at the bar, like no one knew it was him. <laughs> he'd sit there and he'd watch the games. This is when I started on MSG, I guess, or PN. So this is in the 90s. And he'd go sit in Runyon's and he'd uh, say to somebody, what do you think of her? Like they didn't know it was him. And, uh, and he said he got the same answer all the time. He said, I don't like women in sports, but actually she's okay. And that's what he said, the, you know, he'd go to different places. And, you know, can you imagine George? Like nobody knew it was George, but he had a raincoat on and a hat. Good thing there were no cell phones then, I'll tell you that. Especially at Runyon's. Oh, brother. Uh, yeah, okay, that's a whole other story. That's <laughs> <laughs> <Get it, Book. laughs> Susan, do you have a favorite moment in your time as a Yankee broadcaster? Is there one that, that stands out to you? Um, no, there's a few. Yep. The first one was um, Jim Abbott's no-hitter, which I thought was the most extraordinary thing I ever saw in my entire life. And yeah. I still get chills when I think about it. 96... The comeback, the end of the World Series, game six, the old stadium, right? You knew where George's booth was, and our radio booth was right next to it in the old stadium. And um, seventh inning, I came up to the back of the press box because I saw George there. And um, I said, I think we're going to win this. This is going to be good. And I started to go back to my seat. And he said, where are you going? And I said, what do you mean, where am I going? And he said, uh, you stand here. It's bad luck if you move. So I stood with George for the last two innings of the ball game and the final out stuff. I mean, there are pictures of me with George, the final out of the 1996 um, World Series. And it's, you know, there's that, um, you know, how do you, how do you, you know, Jeter's 3000th hit. I cried that whole afternoon. Mariano's last, oh, save, last yeah. game, um, Pettit's last game. Um, you know, Clemens is um, 300th win. There, there's so, there's so much. You know, there's, there's so many different things that um, are emotionally mean something to me. Not necessarily the greatest moments in yeah. history, but emotional, emotional thing. And um, the other thing, and it's so many people don't even remember this. I'll tell you the thing that made my career was that earthquake. 
because I was in the so upper. So true. Team. That's right. I was in FAN. Yeah, right. I was just getting FAN then. Yeah, right. Yeah, w and I was in the upper deck um, behind home plate. And for some reason, my phone did not go out. And I was on the air and I was describing all of it. And it was, I was with the Boston guys, some of the New York guys. And, um, and I stayed and I stayed on the air and I was describing what was going on. And at the end of that, I went downstairs and realized I didn't know anybody. And how was I going to get back to San Francisco? And um, actually, you know who found me? Remember Henry Hecht? Sure. Absolutely. Henry Hecht found me and said, get in this car. And we drove back into the city and I stayed there. A lot of people went home, but I did city side stuff for days. I just fell in love with the city. And that was, I think that was the first time anybody actually took me seriously. Wow. Yeah. That was a huge moment. Book, I don't know if you, if you were in town there, but boy, that was scary. She, yeah. Susan did it a great job a, on that. It was, I was on all the time. And in the morning, um, you know, you can't sleep. So at five 30, it's light. I get up and I hitchhike out to the Nimitz where the, the, um, it had collapsed and you had to have a press credential. <laughs> I showed him my world series pass and the cop let me in. And that's where I met. See, this is why baseball is so great. That's where I met Dave Stewart. Dave mm. Stewart had come out with a generator to make coffee for the cops that were there. And that's where I became friends with him because he was, he's an extraordinary man, extraordinary. And the fact that he beat me out there and I left at five in the morning, I was hitchhiking. Can you imagine now hitchhiking out to the freeway? No, yeah, no, no. But I did. And it was, uh, yeah. So baseball, the, the interconnections between people are, it's extraordinary. And, you know, John always says, um, baseball is different from all the other sports. That, that's the reason, the personal relationships that you've had, that, that you have. Hey, let, let's take it full circle for a second. We mentioned at the top, asked you how you were doing. You said depends on the day. And I hear you. The three of us are all, you know, New York centered. But tell me a little bit about just, again, you got to, whenever we're all asked to be on all these shows, and whenever someone says, are we going to have baseball again? I say, you realize you're kind of asking me the curve of the virus. So right. I'm not going to do that. But what's your feel as far as some of the things that have been proposed? Yeah what your hope is, anything. Well, it it to see, well, but both things, Boog, are, are both very different. Um, and I think that anyone who is not in the middle of this, I mean, this is every time, and, and when I said it depends on what the day, I mean, every time my phone rings, I look to see if it's somebody that's going to tell me that somebody died or that somebody is sick and it's every day and it's all day long. And, and if you're not here, I think you don't really get it because, you know, in, well, why can't we go back? Let's play ball. Um, the idea of Arizona got me so angry. I didn't know what to do. I was, it was like, I, I, I know I love baseball. I am not going to sacrifice my life so that some 25 year old can go out and play ball and, you know, and people can make their money. That's what I thought. And everyone's talking, well, the players are going to be safe. Are they, oh, excuse me, yeah. excuse me. Um, you know, we're, we're here too. Does that mean are there enough hotels? Are the hospitals going to do that? I, I just thought it was so um, sort of like the Roman Empire, you know, the, that um, gladiators come in and if somebody gets killed, they go get another one. And so that people can have amusement. Better off that they open some companies so that people can go back to work and stop worrying about it being a distraction. I mean, the idea that baseball is so important that you have to put people's lives so that someone can sit in their couch and watch television is, you know, it's mind boggling to me. Boy, I'll say, well said, well yeah. said. Boy. Well, that wasn't too cheery, was it? No, nah, no, nah, it was realistic. It was a good question. You know, that, that being said, if they can give everybody, I can't get a test. I mean, I don't, I don't, you That's know, I don't, up here, I can't get a test. If somebody gives me a test and it either says that I have the antibodies or I've had it and it's passed, I'll, then I'll do something. But it's, you know, just because it's peaking, it's because people are off the streets. It's not because yeah. the virus said goodbye. Right. It's still there. And yeah. I think if you're not in the middle of this, you don't, you don't see it. You don't get it. So. Let me just digress for a second. And that was a great question, Bill. Get a great response. Young, as we were getting short on time, but young, when you see uh, young women who aspire to be in your position, What's your advice to them? And you know, what did what did they say to you when, when they introduced themselves to you? Well, the the thing that's amazing is that they uh, 
where I was then, and you know, obviously it was a different career, they don't need my advice. They're young, they're, they've, they're prepared for it, they've known what they've wanted to do since they were little girls. I do have, a, there was one woman that said I was a tiny little girl and I saw you on television. So these girls don't know, and I don't mean girls to be disrespectful, they're in their 20s, they're girls to me. Um, they're, they never knew that they weren't supposed to do this. They're finding out that people don't necessarily want them. But now, if you're any good, and there are a couple that are really good, and if you're any good, then you're going to the same pool as all the guys. And that's what, you know, and it's not always you don't get a job because you're a woman. Sometimes you're not good enough. And, and I think that's what um, younger women have to learn. It's not always anti-women. Sometimes somebody else is better. And that's the thing they have to learn. But you don't, you don't stop. I get tapes all the time from people. I guess they're not tapes anymore, but you know, whatever. And these, these young women are, they're really good. And they're in A ball and double A. And a woman named Melanie Newman is going to be doing some games for the Orioles. I saw that. Yeah, that was a big, uh, big promotion for her. It is. She's going to do the mass and stuff. And she's going to do, I forget how many games, but I've heard her. And she asked, you know, we met during spring training and we went out and um, we were talking about different stuff. She's got, you know, she's got to do, but they know what they're doing. They really know what they're doing. And I think the difference between them and me is that they were never told they can't do this because there were women out. Leslie Visser's out there doing stuff and, and Doris Burke's out there doing stuff and I'm out there doing stuff. So it was never, they're not the only one. They have things and they do things together. I never had that. I know Claire Smith always talks about uh, Steve Garvey was good to her. Was there one guy, uh, you know. Are you kidding? <laughs> Jesse Barfield and I are a, ch a chapter in a children's book. Okay. Uh, you know, the Jesse, in 1987, Toronto Clubhouse was a very odd place. And I went in there and I remember I used to look in um, media guides to see who, where people went to school. And I was talking to Jeff Musselman and I said, I'm going to talk to him. He went to Harvard. He won't yell at me. John Cerruti, the late wonderful John Amherst. Cerruti. Amherst. We had the same degree, an economics degree. And in that clubhouse, um, George Bell had not talked to the press all year in New York because they thought the New York press had cost him the MVP in 86. So 87, he came out. It's September. And um, that was when the writers didn't talk to me either. And I was in there and I saw him starting to talk and I excused myself from John Cerruti. And I went over there with my big Morantz and George Bell started screaming in Spanish and in English, get this blah, blah, out of the clubhouse. And nobody, nobody said a word. And at the, in those days I cried. And I just said to myself, all right, let me get out of here before I start to cry. And it was so quiet. It was like a movie. It was horrible. And I almost got to the door and I hear, what's her name? And one of the writers said, I don't know, Susan something. And I hear Susan. And I turned around and it was Jesse Barfield. And he said, um, I went three for four today. Don't you want to talk to me? And he just did poetry stuff. And, and it was just amazing. And imagine my delight when he was traded to the New York Yankees two years later. And uh, Marla and Jesse and I, we've been friends now for you know, 33 years. And we are a chapter in a children's book about ethics and how you treat people. And I didn't wow. know. Yeah, that, that's my guy. That's my, of course, the Yankees back then were great. Winfield, uh, you have a team with Mattingly, Rigetti, um, Guidry on it. You're not going <laughs> to, um, Dave Winfield, those guys, Willie Randolph, you're not going to get treated too shabbily. Yeah. Well, you want to put a wrap on it? No, I, I mean, that, that I, I love right there. Just, you know, he, I, I think, especially the idea of how you treat people. I just think in this business, it's such a crucial thing, whether it's players and coaches to media, media of any gender. Um, I just, I just feel like it's such an important thing in, in today's world, uh, how you're, how you treat the other people that are, that are around you and everybody, you know, deserves to be treated in a right. decent, kind manner, you know? Susan, I told you it'd be fun. I knew you'd be a great guest. Yeah, all right. See, I combed my hair for a bit. <laughs> That's what I'm talking I, about. You know, I even put on lip gloss. Isn't that, <laughs> nobody talks about that. I haven't had makeup on since I got back from Florida. Is that what you're <laughs> I love it. Hey, Susan. Hey. Thank you so much. Thank you. Both of you. Great to and we'll see be, you. We'll be in touch. Take care. Stay safe, you guys. You love too. You. The great Susan Waldman joining us here on Announcer. <laughs> and now it's on for Book Shambi. I'm Dave Sims. We'll see you next time.